right. Welcome to the OFX Podcast. I'm Dave Claxton. Along with me is Tom Patrician, president of Obstacle Sports Canada and former wrestling Olympian. <clears throat> we were talking about living in the past and what it was like to kind of relive your former glory days and where we're at now and the, the different kind of things. Um, so you missed out on the good conversation. Now we'll get down to the other stuff. So <laughs> first thing I'm going to do, we've talked about this and we've had, had you talked with you. I've interviewed you before. But for the people who aren't here, and a lot of people are talking about this now, basic first question is, what is Obstacle Sports Canada? And as an athlete, why should I pay money and what does it do for me? And that's basic, probably the most important question most people ask. Yeah, thanks, Dave. Um, Obstacle Sports Canada is the federation for obstacle course running and right now Ninja and hopefully soon to be um, hybrid as well as adventure racing. So our, our vision for the Federation, and you know, we've been, um, we're kind of under the world obstacle umbrella. They're the international federation responsible for uh, OCR and, and Ninja and adventure racing internationally. And they've been recognized as that by the top sporting bodies um, at the world level. So we have been nominated and we have set up a not-for-profit here in Canada as the national federation for those sports. And the goal is to create a system in place that works within the Sport Canada system of, of uh, amateur sports so that we've got, you know, everything from the ability to be able to um, support athletes, coaches, um, as well as officials um, at different levels as they're kind of progressing through the sports that they're in. Um, I come from wrestling, as you mentioned. So, you know, I had the benefit of growing up in a sport that has a track or a system in place that you get, you know, depending on your competitions and where you place from a very young age, you start to get recognition from that. And then with that, you know, you start going in, you start going down certain pathways, right from an early grassroots structure, like it might be high school wrestling, or today it could be even club wrestling um, at the ele elementary level. So as you kind of progress through sport, there are benefits, you know, and opportunities to kind of explore to expand beyond just the um, competitions that you're doing. So you might get to go to the provincial championships. Um, and then if you do well there, you get to go to um, events in the USA or in other provinces or to the Canadian national championships. And then once you reach that level, there's the next stage is that, you know, the recognition comes from the national federation. You make the national team, you start getting the opportunities to travel internationally and competing against other international co competitors. And, you know, you're kind of in this system where you've got a combination of, you know, coaches, um, trainers, and everyone kind of supporting you to help you reach your goal, which could be the Olympics, like it was for me, or it could be the Pan Am Games, or just, you know, being able to be, you know, top 10 in the world on the international scene for your sport. So it's, uh, you know, a, it's a pretty organized system. Um, it gets funding from the government. And all that funding kind of gets worked down through to athletes right from the grassroots level all the way up to, you know, the provincial, uh, the top provincial athletes and the top national athletes to go on and, you know, live their dreams in sport. And Obstacle Sports Canada is hoping to one day have that recognition um, for the, the, the sports that I mentioned, OCR, Ninja, Adventure Racing, as well as Hybrid. Um, and each of those sports operate independently under the umbrella. Um, and they kind of control their own fate from there. Very similar to what um, Aquatics Canada does. Uh, you know, they've got a number of different sports that all involve water, all under one umbrella, but each of those sports operate independently and, you know, have their own kind of structure in place to promote their athletes up the, up the, um, the ladder over time. Now, you say both funding from the government and things like that. So I see, like I watch on Instagram and I'll look over and I'll see, especially in Europe, I'll see like public parks with like cool obstacles and, and and things like that set up. Is that the same kind of avenue you have to take to get that kind of um, government support to build things like that? Well, yeah, it, it, there's definitely one route you can go down to as, as a federation. Um, but the, the hurdles to actually get recognized in Canada are, are quite challenging. Um, you know, they've made it, uh, they want to make sure that you have numbers behind any sport that they're going to recognize, right? So, and, and there's kind of multiple stages in this recognition process. Um, so, you know, one of the first requirements is they want you to have provincial associations set up across the country um, to show that you've got representation. You've got to have 5,000 members. You have to have $50,000 in the bank. 
Um, and that's only to get recognition. And then if you get recognized by Support Canada, the next stage would be then funding, but that's very separate. How you spend that funding um, really comes down to the mandate that you have as a sports federation. So yes, it could go to building obstacle courses in different areas. Um, it could go to holding competitions or it could go to training and making sure that you're developing courses for coaches. Um, it could go to training for developing officials in your sport. So how that funding is spent is really up to the national federations, but it's one of the, you know, kind of areas that sports have some uh, control over depending on how, you know, they want to grow their sport within their uh, region. Okay. So what, what is, what is this, what is the structure of obstacle sports Canada? How is that put together? So we're a, I think the first important thing to, to know is that we're a not-for-profit organization registered under the Not-for-Profit not Act um, here in Canada. So we're all volunteers. Uh, we're a board of nine right now. Uh, we've got one provincial association that's being set up as we speak today in Quebec. Uh, we had one in BC previously, but it kind of got put into uh, hibernation over COVID. Um, but it's a group of volunteers sitting at a board level right now, trying to, you know, take action on, on certain initiatives that we want to shoot forward to grow the organization. And by grow, I mean, attract members. Um, we're a member driven organization. So right now we have no funding. Um, everything that we put into the organization um, is spent, everything we kind of draw into the organization is spent on the members, um, as well as some small administrative costs. But overall, you know, for instance, just to give you an example, with the um, OCR and Ninja side of things, our initiative this year is to put together a team to send to the World Championships in Costa Rica. So we are, you know, in the process of qualifying athletes for that and then making sure that they've got all of the necessary kind of elements in place so that when they get to Costa Rica, they're there as part of Team Canada uh, working, you know, towards their dream of winning a world championship. Um, in, in the ninja community, what we're trying to do is really kind of unify the athletes who compete in ninja, um, going, moving, uh, moving away from, you know, these leagues that they've got, they can, you know, those leagues will continue to kind of happen and uh, run on their own, but we want to be able to unify ninja so that we get athletes from across the country, including Quebec, all competing in a national championship one day. We want to help the gyms, um, you know, drive membership at their own kind of business level so that they're successful um, from a business standpoint. Uh, we want to bring safe sport to all of the ninja and obstacle course runners that are out there so that, you know, everyone understands that, you know, whether it's a coach at a gym, whether it's a coach for a national team, um, you know, all of those people have taken the safe sport um, course and have had background checks done on them. So they're to ensure that, you know, we've got the right people in the right places to help our athletes as they, they grow. All right. Now you say safe sport. So when I think of safety, especially I do have a lot, a lot of experience with Ninja and with uh, obstacle sports or OCR obstacle course racing. When you say safe sport, I know that there's obviously courses that can be set up and training and can be set up, but can there be do something like boots on the ground like somebody sees or goes to courses and sees that like for for example this obstacle is unsafe it's not enough padding there's not enough whatever whatever the case may be it's too high it's whatever is that the kind of thing that you know safe sport would would help provide yeah i, I think in a long-term approach that's something we'd like to be able to have some involvement in um, right now, safe sport means more from <clears throat> how do coaches interact with athletes? How do mm -hmm. managers interact with athletes? So it's it's more about the athlete kind of adult relationship. Um, you know, when your athletes are adults, sometimes that's a bit easier. But when you're dealing with youth, um, you've got to make sure that, you know, the people who are responsible for those athletes are dealing with them in a, in a proper way. You know, making sure that there's no type of, you know, uh, verbal it, you know, abuse involved in how they communicate with those athletes, which we've seen in, in a lot of different sports, um, whether it's been, you know, swimming, gymnastics, even wrestling's had issues in the past where coaches, you know, have been a little overbearing and, and obviously that has an impact on athletes. But when it comes to um, sports safety uh, with obstacles themselves, that's something we are, you know, working towards. 
um, you know, with the different uh, for-profit companies that are out there, uh, whether it's Spartan, Mud Hero, you know, our goal is to be able to provide officials for those types of events that are out there and have a relationship with them. And it's not to control what they're doing, but just to be involved so that they understand what, you know, should be in place in order to have a safe event. Um, whether they follow or not is really up to them, but we need to develop those guidelines here in Canada to have available for them to be able to refer to. Um, but in the end, it, it comes down to whether they want to be sanctioned, you know, whether they're happy to be sanctioned under Obstacle Sports Canada for their event or not. Um, of course, any event can come and you know do their own thing where we have no control over that. But for the events that we're involved with, whether we sanction them, whether we're involved putting them on, um, there will be a safe sport aspect to the obstacles that are run. You know, if it's a certain temperature, do you, you know, do you do you have a swim involved if it's below five degrees? Um, all of those things come into play in, in, in order to kind of ensure that the athletes are, you know, not put in harm's way um, just to be able to compete in an event. All right. So. Last year, they had in Belgium. We had uh, the first ever, I would I would say, recognized world obstacle um, world championships. Anyway, um, and this year, I, I know. Well, first off, let's just get your review. Of what you I know you weren't there personally, but what was your? How do you feel it went? How do you feel that the overall event itself went? Because the first one, I mean, things are going to go wrong. <laughs> yeah. Look. Um. I had to really go on what I heard from the athletes that went for Canada. We had four athletes who went um, and their overall perception of it was, it was pretty well run. Um, yeah, there were challenges. Um, you know, we had uh, one of the first ones we spotted right away was that they put Australia on the team Canada um, lanyards um, and IDs. Right. So right away they got our country wrong. Um, and then they didn't have a flag for us at the opening ceremonies. Um, so that was another issue. Uh, I heard that there were some issues with the lack of um, toilets um, during the event. And there was also an issue with the um, uh, one of the obstacles themselves with um, a couple of the elite racers not knowing, you know, how they needed to kind of conduct themselves through a certain obstacle, uh, which was a challenge. Right. So that caused a bit of, I think, frustration with within the athlete community um, and, and raised a bit of talk. But overall, my perception was that the event was actually well run. Um, they did a pretty good job of doing it, especially taking on at late notice um, and, and trying to put it together. Um, they had over 1,600 athletes who attended. So for a first world championship that involves the 100 meter, the 3K and the 15K, um, it seemed like it went pretty well. Uh, you know, there's always going to be room for improvement. And I know because of, you know, other past events, whether it's Spartan putting on a world championship or whether it's the, the OCR, OCRWC um, that we all have very fond memories of, they've been able to create, you know, a pretty high level of event over many years that people now kind of hold every, you know, every world championship to. So, you know, the bar is set pretty high, but, you know, I, I thought the organization in Belgium did a pretty good job um, of, of putting on a, a, a world-class event. All right. And just to be clear, so when he says fond memories, that's like personal memories. That doesn't mean OCRWC has gone anywhere. It still exists. <laughs> it's <laughs> Exactly. Yes. Just means yes. it was fun to race. It's good, good times. Um, and now this year, they're off to Costa Rica. Yes. So yeah. How, what are you expecting from this? And do you, do you expect much different? I guess actually on the good side, what are you looking forward to for it? Well, look, uh, I'm looking forward to, you know, for the Canadian team who's going to be there. I'm looking forward to them having, you know, a bit of the experience that I had as a national team member for Canada um, and traveling to events. Um, so when you show up at an event, you know, first of all, you're coming as a team um, and, and, you know, you, you've got the kit, uh, but you're looked after, right? So you're not having to go to technical meetings. You're not having to worry about, you know, whether you, there's enough water there for you to drink. Um, if there's an issue, you know, you're getting that information relayed to you as an athlete so that you're not having to deal with hassles at an individual level. And if you've got a team of 20, each athlete's having to deal with that. So it's better to have, you know, a, a team of people who can deal with that for you, take it away from you so that you can just compete. And my ultimate goal for 
the Canadian team going this year is to experience a bit of what that's like to be a real Team Canada athlete at an international event um, that I had the opportunity to experience um, in my wrestling. So, you know, if I could bring a little bit of that to the team and the event, you know, organizers um, are able to run this event smoothly, um, it should be a pretty amazing world championships. Yeah, and are you expecting like what like so what's what's going to be different about it? What do you what do you think will be the changes or what positive changes do you think they can make to even make it better? Yeah, you know, look, um logistically, they've had a whole year to prepare. Um and the other side of it is what Belgium didn't have. Um so Belgium kind of took this on last minute. It was the federation who took it on. Um they probably didn't have enough understanding of what it took to put on a world-class event um at at the level where you know world obstacle would have been 100 percent happy right so i think that you know there was a bit of a letdown there from that side of it just from an administrative standpoint um so coming into costa rica there is a professional event organization organizing team that is putting this on um they've got the backing of uh costa rica government um, the uh, Costa Rica Pentathlon Association, um, the Costa Rican OCR Association. Um, they've got uh, Costa Rica tourism, travel and tourism involved. There's real money being put behind the operating of this event because it's a tourist attraction for Costa Rica. Um, so they want to make sure that the athletes who come, you know, really have an amazing time at this event. So from just, a, I think, a quality um, event standpoint, it's going to be at a completely different level than what the athletes saw in Belgium. Now, will it, does that mean it's going to be, um, you know, free of any issues? No, there'll be issues. Um, anytime there's an event, it could be weather, it could be some unforeseen thing that the operators just haven't experienced before that comes into play. Um, so we're going to have to deal with that, or they're going to have to deal with that and adjust. So you know, I would say that for a lot of the athletes going, we've got two right now returning from last year coming, to, you know, to Costa Rica with us. So they're, I'm sure, going to experience something quite different and unique than what they had in Belgium. So just uh, the quality, I think, is going to be a lot higher this year. And that's not to put anything down on what Belgium did. You know, they did a really good job for the time they had and the experience they had on putting it on an event. But my expectation with the groups that are involved um, in Costa Rica, it's going to be at a different level this year. All right. I'm going to ask you two questions that are, I mean, there could be tough questions, but I'm sure you've been asked this before by other people in, in private when you're talking to, especially other athletes. Um, and I'm going to say, especially in the States, what do you tell people who's, who like, they love the sport. They want to support the sport. They're this, but quite frankly, they don't like Ian Adamson and they're skeptical that what do you tell them to assure them that essentially signing up or, or being a member of obstacle sports Canada or, or USA OCR or whatever, but helping support, what do you tell them to assure them that it's, you know, it's, it's going to go right. Or that, that, or that the, the bad, their best interests are in, in your plan kind of thing. Yeah. Look, um, I, there's two sides to that. One, first, let's talk about Ian. Um, I've got a ton of respect for Ian. And I, and I know there are people out there who may disagree with his approach to what he's doing with World Obstacle. But, you know, from my experience working with Ian, um, his heart's in the right place. Um, he's volunteering. He's a volunteer as well, right? So he's not a paid uh, administrator at this point in the sport because there's just not enough funding for that to happen, right? So he's putting his own... Uh, sweat and tears into it, developing, to do developing the sports um, at a world level, right? And that's not easy, right? He's had as many challenges as we've had with World Obstacle that we've had here with Obstacle Sports Canada. You would know being on the board, there's a lot of ups and downs, right? So within any organization, especially as a not-for-profit, you're dependent on the people you have on board in order to help drive the sport forward. And if you don't have traction at times, people lose interest and they leave, right? So you got to bring new people onto the board. You have to invigorate them. You have to get them excited um, to, you know, try to reach the goals 
that are in place for that sport. Um, so at the world level, you know, I understand that people may not like Ian for whether it's personal reasons or for something that he's done in the past. Um, at the end of the day, I believe his heart's in the right place. Um, you know, we both come from a, a sports background, so we kind of understand each other from that perspective. And I know, you know, one of his main objectives with, you know, World Obstacle is to ensure the sport isn't hijacked by for-profit corporations. Um, that's a, a pretty cool goal to have as an organization, right? So he wants to ensure that it's, you know, protected from outside interests. And, you know, depending on whether there's a merger with UIPM or we continue to operate as World Obstacle, um, that, you know, it, there's this kind of environment where it, it's not set up for people to kind of come in and take over based on money at the end of the day. So that's the World Obstacle side. Now, we're a member of World Obstacle. Uh, Obstacle Sports Canada is a member uh, of that federation. And what we do here in Canada is basically, you know, I would say at this point, we're at a very different stage in Canada than where World Obstacle is. So, you know, we're it's still in early days, you know, really trying to uh, bring together uh, people within OCR and Ninja to, you know, understand what we're about. So we're still in the early education phases, I would say, and really just trying to build trust with the community. And what we do here um, is really independent of what World Obstacle does at the international stage. Now, being a, a member federation, we've, we've got to adhere to certain rules, but we also get to define our own bylaws here in Canada that specify, you know, what uh, a safe event is like, um, you know, whether we need to have, um, you know, uh, certain training in place for for coaches or for officials that's really up for us to define um based on the system that we have in canada so you know i would say look at the people involved like myself like yourself like um like uh allison ty you know um xavier out of quebec um we got sean sweeney out of calgary who runs core fit these are people who really care about the sports that they're involved with and you know, want to make a difference. They're not in it for themselves. Um, and I, I feel that way because I've had the opportunity to work with, with all of them. Um, they want to do it for the right reasons, which is, you know, in sport, I think we lose sight of that. Um, a lot of the cases, there are people in all, at all levels of sport, internationally within the IOC. Um, there's probably a few in World Obstacle that I haven't met yet um, that are in it for their own reasons, as opposed to building the sport and, and making it a safe place for athletes. Um, and you see, definitely see it at the provincial and, and, and national level here in Canada, where people have lost sight of why they're in the sport. Um, and it, you know, at the end of the day, you, you just hope they kind of move away and make room for people who are, who want to make a difference and want to see athletes progress and be in a safe environment. So, you know, I, I, it's okay to, I think, to disagree and not, entirely um you know like everybody that's involved but i guess from my perspective um try to understand that you know we're all in this for the right reasons which is to grow the sport and make sure that it's it's safe from others that want to take it down a route that isn't great for athletes or coaches or for the de development of the sport and, and and i'll put this out there from my perspective um if you're a person who who loves ocr who loves ninja who loves whatever Think of it. I think about it as think about the sport, not one person, right? Like if if you have something against one person, you think about the sport. If you're a track and field person, you you don't stop supporting your track athletes and participating in track because you don't like a guy that's running some of the behind the scenes. And again, I'll use the word bureaucracy, but this an administrator. You don't you don't give up on track because of that, right? You. You stick with it and you do, you go to grow the sport. And quite frankly, right now, that is the federations are what will grow the sport. That what the only thing that can that, that bring it on. It's not, like you said, it's not about the people, most of the people running it and stuff. We just love the game, you know, and want to keep going. So that's, that's why I tell them to support it. Um, you mentioned. Dave, can I just add one thing to that? So yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a, that's a very good, a very good point. And uh, this, you know, I think for anyone who's not, not involved and, and doesn't kind of, you know, fully kind of see the big picture, it's a great opportunity to get involved. 
right? And, and be part of the process so that you kind of understand, you know, the pieces that are in place um, and be part of the growth of the sport that you that you love, right? If you want to make a difference, get involved. Um, you know, just being in a, uh, an armchair critic sometimes is not good for anyone uh, because you, you may not understand all the pieces that are involved or why certain decisions are being made. Um, we try to be as transparent as we can, but, you know, we don't discuss everything that happens at a board level uh, just because there are some things that just have to be kept private in any discussion, right? So, um, you know, I'll share one experience I had with um, um, the board of BC Wrestling. Um, I was on the board for a number of years, um, and this is only 10 years ago when I had moved back from Australia, and I found that I had to, I had to leave um, because I was starting to dislike the people that I grew up with and, you know, once respected um, because I felt they had lost sight of why they were in the sport. It was no longer about the athletes. It was no longer about developing the sport. They had kind of lost that sight or or drive and it was all of a sudden about them and eventually i just you know had this huge rant at the hgm at the end of the year and said look if you really want to make a difference get on the board and do that understand why decisions are being made why money is being spent in certain areas um you know there are generally reasons for that um it, it doesn't come down from one person in an organization saying oh this is the way it is so it has to be that way generally there's rules in place there's processes and systems that have to be adhered to um in order to uh properly function uh within the system that's in place and and i'll again I, i'm gonna put another thing onto it too if you're one of the people who says oh i don't like the direction of the sport or i want to do this or i want this i want this it should be this it should be this it should be that and I'm just going to talk from a North American perspective. Talk to us. I put out before an open invitation to come to a meeting, uh, a virtual meeting to anybody, right? Come and listen, come and jump on, have your opinion be heard. Um, I'm sure if you're in the States and you call Ethan, Ian Hosick and say, hey, I want a voice, I want to be heard. He's going to go, great, cool, come help. And, you know, just like you say, armchair, armchair critic, it's easy. I do a lot of it. That's, you know, that's, that's what we do here, but I'm also trying to help too. So I always feel you, you can't, you know, you can't complain if you don't want to do anything to help, right? You can't bitch if you don't vote. And so stop bitching if you're not going to vote. That's that. Just, just do that. <laughs> I'll, leave that I'll leave it at that one. Um, you did mention um, UIPM and some people have this fear and this is, it doesn't make sense to me. And I've had to separate the distance, but I'll separate the two things for people, but some people fear that by pentathlon having something between Ninja and OCR as one of their events, an obstacle event as one of their five events will somehow destroy OCR or that that is the only thing that the federations want to push. We only want, we want OCR to be 60 to hundred meters. That's what we want. And I, I know it's silly, but I just might even you want to talk on it. Yeah, look, um, pentathlon is, you know, first of all, it's an interesting setup, um, especially here in Canada, right? So um, right now it consists of uh, really four different events. You've got swimming, fencing, um, you've got laser run, which is shooting and running, uh, plus you have horse riding. Now, the, the important thing to remember here is that all of those sports um, operate independently um, in, in many different countries and internationally, right? So there's this aquatics federation that has swimming. There's a world athletics that has, you know, running. Um, there's the world fencing organization that has fencing. So pentathlon doesn't control those sports. They only control the events that they operate within pentathlon. Um, and of course, now they're moving away from horse riding after the Paris Olympics. Obstacle is the replacement for that. And it's right now a 70 to 80 meter course head to head. Um, they only control that event um, because it's for their athletes as part of pentathlon. So that's the important piece to remember here is that it's completely, you know, while obstacle is going to be in the LA Olympic Games, it's there as a pentathlon event for pentathlon athletes. Um, and they can do really whatever they want to with that event. Now, does that impact, you know, OCR or other ninja events? Not today. Um, and will it, you know, impact 
those events, those sports moving forward. It shouldn't if it's dealt with properly. And that's something we're trying to do with World Obstacle. So all the federations now are kind of in this discussion phase of, of what obstacle will look like moving forward if there's this potential uh, merger opportunity with the UIPM, which is the International Association for Pentathlon Modern. Um, there's a real fear out there that they're just going to suck up OCR, Ninja, and whatever else is kind of included in that umbrella and, you know, throw everyone to the, so the curb so that they can just do their 80 meter event. Um, that couldn't be further from the truth. Um, really, this event, you have to think of it as just a one event within pentathlon. The big opportunity, Dave, is, you know, how do we now, now that we've got a obstacle event within pentathlon, how do we get an OCR event uh, within the Olympic Games? How do we get a 100 meter standalone event into the Olympic Games or the Pan Am Games? Um, that is just, you know, the best, you know, let's call them ninja athletes of today um, competing in a head to head race or the best, you know, 3K OCR athletes or 5K or 15K competing in those events at a world international event, whether it's a multi games or world championships. So you have to kind of separate the two. What Pentathlon is doing is very much their own prerogative. Uh, what happens, you know, with OCR and and, and Ninja and, and other events that kind of grow from those sports is really up to those sports. Um, to, you know, and if they're under World Obstacle, of course, World Obstacle will define that. But if if it's under a merged entity, um, the committees and board will help define what that looks like. But I don't see it as a, well, I've got concerns. I don't see it as a, uh, roadblock to the sports growing uh, beyond what they are today. Well, I've tried to tell people before and I've related it to to skiing. So like when skiing started in the Olympics, oh, sorry, I'll go backwards. There is slalom, there's moguls, there's trick skiing, there's ski jumping, there's biathlon, there's cross country skiing, there's all sorts of skiing. They didn't all start in the Olympics at once. It started with downhill. And then that went well. So they branched out and they brought in more and more and more and more. The way I look at it is with pentathlon using some form of obstacle sports in the Olympics, that exposes more people, exposes the world to, to different versions of obstacle sports where they can say, okay, cool, that worked. We like that. Let's test this other way. Let's test this longer version. Let's test this. The, the development and growing of what I would call short, short course obstacles, obstacle sports does not destroy your 15 K does not destroy your 21 K does not destroy your three or your five K it's, it's right there. It's, they all work together. You don't have to have, you don't have to pick, you know, you don't have to, you don't have to decide it's, it's all anyway, right. So I've just told, I've told them the same thing, like that the, the, having that in there does not mean that is now what OCR is. That does not mean that that's what, World Obstacle or Obstacle Sports Canada or whoever else wants OCR to be. That's what pentathlon needs as an extra event. That's what they want. Yeah, yeah. Right. And see, I, I think a good um, uh, a good example is triathlon. Yeah. Um, very few people know that was actually started. The International Triathlon Union was actually started by a Canadian, um, someone here from Vancouver. Um, now he's since passed, but you know he over many years built the ITU into what it is today. And, and and that's not triathlon, like it's a short course. And that's not what triathlon is. That's not the only thing triathlon is today. Yeah. You know, you have, you have uh, the Ironman and there's different, you know, lengths in, in Ironman, distances in Ironman, which I love watching. I'm enthralled by L Lionel Sanders and, you know, Sam Long and the competitions they have. I watched uh, an hour of YouTube last night on that, um, just covering the latest race. Um, but you know, it may never be in the Olympic games, but it's still part of triathlon today. Right. So the sport is innovating, which I find, you know, fascinating as it's been around for 35 or 40 years now, uh, and still finding new ways to grow, um, as a sport. And it's while the ITU is there, they don't govern Ironman. Ironman is a for-profit corporation. Yeah. And that's kind of see how I see obstacle moving forward. You know, we've got Spartan yeah. who does support 
you know, world obstacle. And there are partnerships in place, uh, but it'll continue to operate as a for-profit corporation moving forward, um, very independent of what OCR does at the international level within a, uh, a sport system. So from that perspective, you know, I, I think there's a ton of opportunities for OCR and, and ninja type events to come into the games down the road as the light gets brighter and brighter on the obstacle event within pentathlon. And, and the, the key that a lot of people don't understand about the Olympic Games specifically is that the IOC is really trying to do kind of two major things with the sport moving, with the, the games moving forward. They want to be able to, to, you know, make sure that there are events that youth and the world wants to watch. And two, they want to reduce complexity and cost. So, you know, if they're dealing with, you know, more and more federations, it increases complexity, increases cost. Uh, if they have to increase the number of athletes who attend, um, it drives up the cost. Um, the number of venues that the host, the host committee has to um, build, it adds to the cost, right? So anytime you can kind of work within the current system as a sport, um, gives you more opportunities to grow. And we've seen that with many of the, uh, the winter sports that you mentioned. Um, and, you know, and, you know, one example I could foresee happening is, you know, once we've got, uh, you know, obstacle at the uh, LA games as part of pentathlon, um, it's an easy conversation to say, hey, look, you've got this uh, mountain biking course, you know, sitting empty for half the games. What if we ran a 3K or a 15K course there, OCR course? Um, the, the, the venue is already set up. You just have to build some obstacles, right? So all of a sudden now you've got, you've reduced complexity. You've been able to, you know, bring some more athletes in without adding a lot of additional cost, And you're able to appeal to a whole new broader audience who wouldn't have been interested in the games before that. So, you know, there's going to be huge opportunities with this partnership with Metathlon. And I just want to say here in Canada, we've got a great relationship with Pentathlon Canada. Um, it's a, a mutual relationship. Um, you know, they have no experience with obstacle. Um, so they need our help. We've got that technical experience. We can bring that to yeah. what they're doing. So it's an exciting time for us, but an exciting time for them. And, you know, it's not a control thing. They don't want to control what we're doing. And we have, you know, no, no plans to control what they're doing. We just want to make sure that you know, that obstacle event, that obstacle event that they are running is a safe event for their athletes and has an opportunity to grow over time. All right. One more question. Mm. OCR Federation. Is there going to be an old school Montreal Canadiens, Boston Bruins line brawl? Like what, what's going on there? <laughs> um, I, I don't foresee that happening. So um, for the viewers out there, uh, a couple of people have gotten together from Europe and form and form the world OCR federation um, with the goal of that being the official federation for obstacle course running. Um, now there's a couple of issues um, that I think are going to make it very challenging for them to do that. Um, one is uh, world obstacle already has the rights internationally to kind of govern OCR. Yeah. Um, so for any new organization to come into play today um, to try to do that is going to, find it difficult, but that's not to say they can't, you know, put on events. They can't, you know, create confusion within the marketplace. Um, that's definitely going to happen. So we've got to be um, active about trying to explain how we're different from them. And, you know, my understanding on why it was created was that there was some frustration with this potential merger with Pentathlon. Um, and in the com communication that I've seen, they, you know, it, it was like the deal was already done when we haven't even voted at, at, it, at the International Congress yet for that to happen. So there has to be a lot of things set in place. And, you know, going back to what I said about Ian earlier, you know, his vision and my vision, because we've both been involved with international sport, in, is to ensure that we've got a, a seat at the table, that we're able to define what that merger looks like before we say yes. So th there's no opportunity that I see where we're going to go into this with our eyes closed and, and just basically allow pentathlon to continue to operate in the fashion that it is. Um, we believe it'll have to have a name change. Um, we believe there'll have to be equal representation of obstacle people on the board. 
in order to govern the sports that are part of this new federation that comes. Um, but it's way down the track. Uh, World, o World OCR, um, I, I think, is going to have a lot of challenges moving forward, um, just trying to get federations involved and athletes involved um, for their events. So, you know, I, in the short term, it'll probably create some confusion, uh, but I, I think it'll be difficult for them to create traction uh, because you and I both know how difficult it is to operate um, a not-for-profit in the sport area. It, it's tough. And if you don't have traction, um, if you can't get people to come to your events and believe in what you're promoting, um, it's very difficult to take that long term. All right. Um, is there anything else you want to go over? Anything else you want to touch on that we didn't get to talk about? Um, yeah, look, I, I just want to talk a bit more about the Costa Rica World Championships, because I think we've got a huge opportunity for anyone who wants to go to the, these World Championships. Um, first of all, the events themselves. Um, if you haven't run a stadium course, um, the 3K is going to be in the stadium in San Jose. So that's going to be super exciting. 20 obstacles. Um, everyone's going to be in that one area for basically two out of the three days. Um, the 15K course is going to be held at a coffee plantation. And all the athletes will basically bust there on the day of, compete, and then bust back to where the athletes' village is at the stadium. Um, and plus the 100-meter event at the stadium itself. So, you know, I think just the three events themselves are going to be unique and different from what other people have experienced. Um, and then, you know, just uh, for those who are sitting on the fence right now and be thinking, okay, are thinking maybe, why do I want to go? You know, like, who else is going? Um, let me tell you who's going. Um, we've got Samuel Hubert, the, the modern um, superhero. Um, he signed up and going. Um, we've got our first kind of youth athlete um, coming, who's one of the top 13 year olds in the country at both Ninja and the 100 meter course. Uh, we've got Ariel Fitzgerald out of Calgary, um, Beatrice out of uh, Quebec, who's one of the top um, Spartan racers. Um, you know, she's had access both in Ninja and Spartan. Um, so we've got, you know, two athletes, as I mentioned, coming from last year, uh, Mike Poots and Jana Harris. Um, and then I'll be there myself um, competing as well. So right now we've got 12, we're hoping to get, you know, 20 to 30. So there's still room um, to come and apply and, and be part of what should be a pretty unique experience. Um, as I said, I, I really want everybody to come away from the experience, you know, feeling like they were really part of uh, Team Canada. Um, and that goes from, you know, the, the camaraderie that we create, as well as the support system in place, um, so that you feel like you were able to focus on your events and not have to worry about all the other dynamics kind of swirling around you. When is the when is the date? When is the World Championships? Um, the dates are August twenty second to twenty fifth in Costa Rica, San Jose, Costa Rica. So it's coming up quickly. I think there's one hundred and thirty six days um, remaining before the event. Um, so yeah, and I know for the people back east, it's a bit easier to get to. It's one flight. Where uh, myself and others here in the west, it's I think at least two. So um, yeah, getting there is you know obviously. Easy easier than getting to Europe um, and a little bit less expensive. So from that perspective, um, it should be a bit easier for athletes from North America to get to. Uh, but uh, yeah, it'll be a pretty exciting time um, for all the athletes who want to go. All right. Well, I am not, uh, I'm not saying anything for certain, but that 3K in a stadium really piques my interest. Yeah, I'm, I'm, it should I'm, be a cool I'm, event. I'm, 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 I've I'm always just, wanted to do a stadium race. I might start looking at some flights. <laughs> You should, Nate. It'd be great to have you there with the team. And uh, yeah, look, it's. Um, I'm hoping to make this a special experience for everyone who goes um, and really, you know, come away from it thinking that, hey, this was different. This was uh, something I've never experienced before. So if I can do that, for me, that's success. Whether, you know, you go there and win or have a personal best, um, that's beside the fact. If I can help you do that within an environment um, that makes it easier, um, that's really the sign of success from my point of view for everyone who goes. That's awesome. I think it's a great way to finish, Tom. Thank you so much for doing this, for coming on, and not just for this, but for all you are doing for the sport. And um, Tom's not going to toot his own horn, but I will. The guy puts in a ton of hours and a ton of effort, and 
gets very little in return. <laughs> you know, like like he says, everybody's volunteering. Everybody's doing what they can just because they want to make it better because they want to make something cool. They want to make something for the future generations of obstacle, obstacle racers, obstacle sports racers, ninjas, whatever you want. They want to make it better for the people that are right coming behind us. Anyway, thank you so much, Tom. We appreciate it. We can't wait to talk again. Thanks, Dave. Happy to happy to have the talk.